Well, thanks for joining us on the latest edition of Ed Talks. Um, I know that we get an increasing listenership from people who listen to uh, me and my guests on their commutes. So with that in mind, we always try and keep it to around sort of 15, 20 minutes, because for most of you, that's the length of time you've either got to sit in your car or be in a train. And actually, my guest uh, this time is someone that I've known, not well, but known of for crikey, almost 50 years. Um, and in my youth, he used to spin the tables at discotheques I used to go to in the 70s down in the West Country. Well, actually, probably all over England, he can tell you more for himself. But more importantly, during my career as an agent, I used to come across him as a high-end sound and vision man, um, someone who was increasingly well-known for putting uh, audiovisual into people's high-end houses. And of course, for all of us, high-end houses are, uh, well, sound in our houses is, is an ever-increasing issue. Cars seem to have got it right, but I thought it would be good to ask Angus Gibson, who's my guest, to talk a little bit about how it works these days, because I know in the past it used to be a very different ball game. So Angus, tell the listeners a little bit about how you started in this and, and a little bit about your history. Ed, thank you, and thank you for inviting me. Um, the history you and I both know, because we went back together when uh, we were in our late teens, and it did start with discotheques. And, um, Having left school, I have to say, all I wanted to do is to be in music. In those days, we all had ambitions to, to go ahead and either be in the army or join the city or join property industry, which you very, very successfully did. And one of my friends, I can say, is not only still in it, but has had the most extraordinary career. And we watched it with delight. And you and I did come across one another, really from the early days to this day and um, it was my absolute passion of music and the reproduction of sound of music in those days it was disco music and rock and roll music and and how we loved it um, and in fact the poster behind you the Rocky Horror Show was even part of that uh, scene in the late 70s um, but what it spawned was that I came up to London in 1975 when there were still records and vinyl and the cassette was sort of in the on the horizon well i still remember in those days if you had a tanberg cassette deck a rotel amp and wharfdale speakers that's yeah you were cool you were considered to be cool yeah well you certainly attracted you attracted two people you attracted nerds and you attracted girls i'm not quite <laughs> sure <laughs> but um i think really what happened with juliana's discotheque which was the sort of the big pushed from 75 into the 80s um, was my passion for music, but really meeting and being thrown into London society and scene. Um, I mean, my, my sort of uh, my, my, my original early sort of being thrown into it was actually doing the party for the Rolling Stones after one of their Earl's Court gigs. And uh, to be honest, you spend a night up in Mayfair with that lot and and, and after that, meeting architects and interior designers through that whole scene was pretty extraordinary for an 18 year old. Um, and really what came out of it was clients wanting the theme of discotheque, but all over that house. So coming across from America in the early 80s was this idea that the Americans were beginning to, to multi-room their music and their vision and have small cinema rooms in their houses, because of course the, the US are, in, certainly in those days, and you could argue today, are pretty much more advanced. But by God, did the UK catch up quickly? Because my clients were, uh, I remember a lot of art dealers I was, I was happened to be working for, um, who employed all the latest interior designers and architects. But because they were going to New York and to Los Angeles, they were coming, the art dealers and, and, and others were, and, and the bankers were coming back with, oh, this is what the Americans do. And one of them said to me, because I ran his discotheques every year, can you do it in my house? And that's really was the start of it. It was, I was as intrigued as he was. Um, so I, I, I made it my business to find out how to do it. And I simply 
and effectively provided a discotheque in five rooms. But so how did they do that? So, so in those days, Angus. I mean, obviously, we all know that you could have your your turntable in those days, your amplifier and your speakers. So what was the advance? What was the next stage on from that then? It was a mechanism. It was an, a piece of electronics, which today is done with the likes of Sonos, etc., which we can come on to. But in those days, it was clunky uh, 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 electronics that push buttons on a wall and uh, you opened up a, a what's called a relay. And if you were playing a record, a record, a vinyl record in the main center in the library, it simply switched it on in the kitchen or study or bedroom or bathroom. And, and it was as basic as that. It was like switching on a radio. And in fact, we had lots of radios constantly tuned into stations and we simply had a switch on the wall. You switch it on and, it, and simply the radio came on. It was very basic stuff. And quite expensive, and I imagine, in those days. Sorry? I mean, quite expensive, I would imagine, in those days. Getting that sort of thing done, no one had any idea how much it was, it was going to cost. As you said, you were dealing at the, at the top end of the market. I mean, I'm assuming that costs have changed enormously in that area as advances have been made. So talk a little bit about how the... We were talking before we started about how a lot of the people who were pr producing this sort of kit were really... They didn't know exactly what they were doing. They were sort of pushing the boundaries themselves that some of it didn't actually work terribly well and it was hugely expensive. These days, you could buy stuff relatively cheaply and it works quite easily. I still have no idea. We can talk a little bit more further on, further down the line about sort of maybe what represents value for money these days. But talk to me a little bit about the progression of, of costing in all of this and how it's all changed over time. In the early days, it was, it was hi-fi, as we remembered that word, high fidelity. And there were a few firms mainly British and a couple of American, but at the British, I have to fly the flag. The likes of Quad, Tannoy, Keff, Name, Lynn, um, Rogers, I mean, I can, Meridian, I can go on and on. There are a number of really wonderful uh, firms, electronics firms that produced hi-fi. And you might well have had one of those pieces at, your, at university, Ed. Um, and that, that was it. it was a, they were sold from shops as a rule. And what, to answer your question is, for, for, so we were using professional equipment on the discotheque, but actually things like record players and quad amplifiers were, were also used in high-end, well, those that could afford it, if I'm honest with you. Um, the, the onslaught of the, the Japanese had come across to Europe with Sony uh, and Toshiba and and um, JVC, people like those firms were coming across and providing relatively inexpensive uh, music systems for, for everybody. But where I was, we had to literally make the systems work to integrate them into people's houses room on room. So the mechanic, the, the, the mechanisms had to be made. So we then effectively used the amplifiers and the loudspeakers and the cassette players. I just want to remind you that CD wasn't launched until 1983. And we still and then only had three TV stations and no satellite. You know, it's quite amazing to think that it wasn't that long ago. And Wi-Fi wasn't invented. I mean, the internet wasn't obviously invented. So I'll well, come on to that later of how it really changed the entire landscape of, of, of audio visual for, for high-end residential. But I mean, in those days, it was very expensive. And actually, if I'm honest, if I remember, because there were very few moving parts, not much went wrong. You pushed a button and it worked, end of. And um, so there was a really successful period, which probably launched my career. Um, and I come really from the professional side of the business. And so it worked, it worked very, very well. I think what you alluded to is that what then happened in the late eighties and right through the nineties were big manufacturers such as Crestron and Lutron, uh, American firms, uh, and a couple of British firms were for starting to use what you remembered in your days of showing high-end residential to your clients, where we had touch screens on the wall and where they were computerized and where these systems were effectively run from, from, from computers. 
Uh, and that's really when it not only got very expensive, but as you remembered, and I'm afraid I can put my hand up to it, some of it didn't work. And, and it was, was incredibly, very... incredibly complicated. Yeah, it was. And it was made complicated actually by, I have to tell you, those uh, geeks who were far more interested in trying to program someone's house like um, Starship Enterprise than actually to allow people to live you know, in, in their homes. Yeah. So what presaged the change then? Was it, was it Wi-Fi? Was it better cabling? Could people start to use internal wiring from their mains systems? What sort of heralded the change from, because I remember, as you say, the Lutron Crestron, it started off being a bit of a sort of badge of honor. Someone said, oh, you know, it would be part of the particulars you do for a property, Lutron lighting or particularly Lutron, I remember. So what then changed? What, what, what was the next stage after that? And what presaged that change? What caused the change? I think two things. First of all, interestingly enough, the professional teams that were putting these amazing properties together for, for their wealthy clients. I think it was the architects, the interior designers, the M&E designers that actually slightly put a stop to what you just been talking about, which is um, that these these fantastic houses been slightly spoiled by over engineered, too much integration, too many, as you say, complicated computerized systems, badly, if I have to tell you, often programmed by those that probably didn't, uh, you know, weren't weren't as qualified as they should have been, and there was a backlash. There was a backlash from overseas clients who were really, you know, wanting the best to, I think, some of the really great interior designers and architects of the last quarter of a century. Um, David Milanarik, David Hicks, um, Ali Sagachi. I mean, there's a whole list, uh, Robert Adam. A lot of these architects practices um, uh, and interior designers were actually getting fed up with the fact that these systems were being brought in by the client, by the way, not by them. And um, they didn't work very well. Okay? So, so what, okay. It was that backlash. And then I think the manufacturers, with fairness, saw the problem and it just got better and better. So if, we, if you want to move on to now how the big sea change, the C, big sea change was the use of the of network internet or wi-fi within the property that is that was the game changer because i always remember before that everyone used to talk about cat 5 cat 6 cabling it was it, it was all about cabling wasn't it with a with a decent capacity and then it still is it still is is it i mean absolutely i mean obviously the argument about wi-fi streaming bluetooth you know cable i mean i would assume that you know my idea, this is jumping ahead a little bit, but my idea of perfection is still the fact that you use a turntable and everything's done by cable, there's no Wi-Fi, nothing else. And I don't think a lot of the listeners will necessarily be interested in sound loss and loss of quality and all that sort of thing, because frankly, most of the stuff we listen to these days is so good. Um, but interesting that you say cabling is still is still the, the ideal way, or, or, or it's still a, a sensible way of doing this. Um, I mean, OK, so you then had Wi-Fi came along. So so talk about the development of particularly I, th I think we're talking about Sam, the vision thing these days. I think so many people have TVs in all their rooms and I don't think that's necessarily quite so much of an issue. I think the sound is a very different thing because people often put TVs in and then forget that the sound quality, to be frank, is crap in a lot of televisions. You have to have a sound system that goes with it. Um, so what then made the difference? So you, you just said that the networked um, Wi-Fi became the sort of the the way forward. So, how was that used in in the development of sound? So, it, it, I'll, I'll just say again, connectivity is everything. Contact by cable is everything. There are some companies who use sort of fiber optics and other means of trying to get it as pure and seamless as possible. But Wi-Fi itself um, does work, as we know with the Sonos product. You can buy one from from John Lewis before 99, pop it in the kitchen and it is will connect to the Wi-Fi with no wires. And it does work. I'm not suggesting it doesn't. The quality's sort of there. But I'm saying is that 
wiring is everything, even bringing the Wi-Fi into that particular room. Don't expect it to go through a 10 inch concrete wall or where there are steels above, which most of these properties include steel and concrete somewhere. Wi-Fi does not penetrate many of those walls uh, and ceilings. So to bring the Wi-Fi into a room, you, you have to have a cable somewhere. So it's a complete myth. And, and many people have fallen over with this, particularly clients who've got who've rather arrogant, saying, I don't want any wires in my house. Well, they're making a huge error because when the house is finished, it doesn't work. OK, well, I, I mean, for a lot of people listening to this, the idea that they can go and I mean, it's it's you, you've mentioned some great names and clearly uh, you and I were both lucky enough to work at the high end of the market for a lot of our working lives, which was which was great fun. And we came into contact with some very interesting people. If you're someone listening to this and you're thinking, um, yes, I'd like to improve the quality of sand in my house. So someone's living in a in a pretty normal house with a pretty normal budget, if I can put it like that, for our, for our listeners. What would you suggest to them is the best way of improving the quality of their audio? Or is there anything you can suggest as as being a good idea? Well, we're, we all use these platforms such as Spotify. So first of all, you've suddenly got an entire library of music worldwide, which is extraordinary. Uh, secondly, you cannot ignore Sonos and there are other products available. But that sort of that system is extraordinary and brings to life what you know all your music even if you're still playing from a cd you can still actually play your own music through the systems or from your telephone i think to to answer your question about quality is 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 go back go back to your to the roots um have a room with a decent pair of often british loudspeakers i hasten to add bowers and wilkins bmw are a very good choice um get a decent amplifier um, just do a little bit of work on that. Even richer sounds, bless them, will give you a perfectly reasonable amplifier, the old fashioned type with knobs on the front. Have one room where you could sit back and really enjoy music. As you suggested, probably attach the television to it, which is not that difficult. And have one space that you could really listen to the full quality of music. Everywhere else, if you want it, again, these little Sonos speakers, ceiling speakers, they do a, a very perfectly good job. But as long as it's it's sort of piped in correctly, set up well, most important thing is to have a good quality internet speed and connection from broadband. Without it, it will stop working. Yeah, someone told me the other day that there's a shortage of pressing capacity for pressing um, vinyls, as they're now called. LB there are, there is. Uh, in the UK, so clearly that's something that's coming back. So um, if, if if anybody out there's under probably 45, 50, and they haven't listened to a turntable through a decent speaker and uh, through a decent amp and a pair of a set of speakers, go and buy a turntable. They're relatively cheap, and go and buy a vinyl and listen to that before you go and do anything else. But I think your advice about having a room in the house is a really good one for people. Um, I know you might not be able to mention names. Um, but is there any house or property that you've done that particularly stands out in your memory, the sort of grooviest place you've done? Well, there, there, were, there were many, uh, and I remember them with, with a lot of pride and, 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 and sometimes a bit of a wry smile on my face. Um, I think my, one of my proudest moments is actually wasn't, well, it was originally a private residence, is, is um, Villa Feltrinelli. Um, which is Hot Grand Hotel Villa Feltrinelli, which is on Lake Garda in Italy. And um, it was a private house, the most stunning house owned by the Feltrinellis. And there's a marvellous American hotelier, turns it into probably one of the most unique, exclusive hotels in the world. Uh, and it is just heaven. Hardly been changed architecturally and in the interiors to what it was. And I was commissioned to put in, funnily enough, that early system with push buttons on the wall, push buttons by your bed, brass plate engraved with um, music, jazz, classical, opera, pop, whatever. Uh, we, we downloaded all the music onto hard drives in those days. This was 28 years ago. 
Uh, we refurbished, upgraded some of the electronics recently. None of the music has changed. All the buttons are still in place because that's what the guests continue to ask for. I would say that's one of my proudest moments, an amazing project. But I think as far as sort of, um, as you alluded to, something more closer to the home and probably in Knightsbridge was an extraordinary project we did in Wilton Crescent. And the entire property was taken down except for the facade. Uh, and instead of putting in endless swimming pools and, and, and gymnasiums and, God, and all these waste of spaces that many people don't use underneath these vast houses, uh, the, the, the designers, um, uh, and, and this is from Paris, Bruno Monard, who's a very famous interior designer from Europe, um, famous for his work with Cartier and LVMH, but he also does into staggering private houses. And he was involved in this project. And instead, he just wanted to entertain, entertain, entertain. So naturally, things like the dining rooms, drawing room, kitchen, all of that absolutely beautifully set out. And underground, which they did go, uh, he wanted just a party room for all occasions, uh, a home cinema, uh, and, and that was it. He, he just wanted to be able to entertain after dinner. And um, we did put in a party room, and going back to my discotheque days, we put in a professional sound system for DJ not a domestic sound system. So that was um, something to add to your bucket list, Ed, that don't try and make a party room out of uh, uh, domestic hi-fi equipment. You've got to use professional sound equipment, which is what we did. And the home cinema was extraordinary. And I, I can't say no more than that, seating about a dozen people. Well, I love the idea of, I mean, I think the old fashioned stuff, my father's still got an old music center, which he uses mm. as a, he still uses cassettes and the cassettes go around that one come, gets pushed out and the next one falls into it and it goes around on a permanent loop. And I'm, we used to have that at home. And I love the idea of that there's somewhere in Italy, which is still using the same technology, well, not the same technology, but the same physical interface as it was 28 years ago I think that's I think that's wonderful and I presume the sound quality is probably is probably great I mean I know that there are a lot of people that say that sound quality has deteriorated over the years you know with the advent of digital uh, reproduction rather than you know the the aforementioned stylus on the vinyl which produces a much more uh, uh, real um, sound but as I, as I said earlier I strongly recommend that people go and try that if they haven't I mean People will be coming to the end of their commute, I think, by now. So one of the things I just wanted to ask you as well was whether you, you've mentioned a couple of things briefly, but um, do you have any recommendations for if people want to get it right? I think, I think the mention, by the way, you made of TVs, connecting up TVs, and I, I've done that at home, and it makes a massive difference putting running your TV sound through, through a hi-fi system, through a proper amplifier makes a huge difference but have you got any recommendations for sound versus value i mean you've you've alluded to a couple of brands already and i don't think there's any reason not to but i think for people listening they'd really appreciate it if you have any if you can cut through any of the bullshit you sometimes get with the advertising well i think you know john john lewis is a marvelous destination but if you if you can if you go it's quite old-fashioned peter jones in sloan square for example if you go through their sort of av department um, in a way, I would say that, they, that that's a sort of a bit of a nod to the past and to what they're offering to the future. So they will, they will offer you good quality sound bars, for example, for underneath your television. They will offer you Sonos and similar products. They don't have a hi-fi department, but they, in a way, you get the flavor in somewhere like that. But I would say with the... Uh, uh, the interest in vintage, which, have, which is all over your home now, and even clothing uh, uh, and, and artwork and posters, even the one behind you, Ed, are all becoming very fashionable and fun and uh, of value and enjoyment. And I would say, look back at what sound has been about. Don't just buy a, a black box to sit on the windowsill. It, it does work, but if you want to explore a bit more, 
um, you know, look at some quality loudspeakers, you know, a pair of speakers, a decent amplifier. Those are the two ingredients to, to, to help you. Um, isn't particularly expensive if you want to sort of spend some time just, you know, looking at it, a thousand pounds, 1200 pounds or something, you know, then, then just add a Sonos box to get Spotify and you will then have the reproduction. The problem is with our young is, is that they've been sticking little headphones in their ears for the past 10 years or so. And, um, you know, they, a lot of them, and some, some of them even listen to music from their iPhone without the headphones, which is terrible. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't want to sound like an old, well, I am sounding like exactly that. But I think with the interest in vintage, uh, uh, and and rock and roll and film, you know. Look back, have a look, do a bit of research. Um, there's quite a big, thriving um, uh, uh, vintage market, actually. Uh, and is there any website? Is, is there any website you suggest? I mean, I can I can waste hours on the internet looking for this sort of stuff. Is there anywhere you particularly suggest people go? No, yeah, funnily enough, I tell you, there's there's several. There's there's not a very good name, but they're from Norfolk called. Hi-Fi Emporium. That's a really good deal. They do fantastic uh, vintage used um, equipment. Um, another terrible name, Audio Gold. But um, <laughs> but they're but they're a really good shop, a really good firm. Um, so go on a couple of those and look mainly for British brand and ask about British brand because that's where the quality was. And they're also, um, you know, they're, they're items of beauty. Yes. I think that's, you know, I was, I was chased away by the interior designers in the 80s because they had this hatred from the 60s and 70s of black boxes. And as your dad still has, you know, a big teak box in the corner um, where it's, I tell you, it's cool now. It's now it's the new cool. Yeah. Well, I think that's right. I mean, look, Angus, it's been great to get your insight into some of this stuff and hear about some of the I, 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 I could I could absolutely imagine myself. Well, I can't imagine myself being by Lake Garda in a house or in a place like that. I would absolutely love to go there right now. Um, but people still need advice. And if they wanted advice or they wanted to be able to get in touch uh, for some consultancy work or whatever it is to find out what they should be doing in their house or indeed whether they're rebuilding their house and they really need a proper consultant to, to tell them mm. how, how, how best to do it. How should they best get in touch with okay. you? Okay, well, there is, a, um, there is an association which I was sort of part of bringing over from the US probably 25, 28 years ago called CEDIA, C-E-D-I-A. And they're definitely worth, and they're, a, they're a, 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 a legitimate association for the audiovisual industry. Uh, and so I, I definitely visit them. Uh, my advice is don't use uh, one man and his dog because he's probably a splinter from one of the firms that is, was set up, one of the AV companies, and he's off on his own thinking he can provide all that he did for the big company for, for clients. Um, and I'm not just dissing some of these people. Some of them I know, some of them I probably employed. And they're doing a perfectly good job. I think if you're doing a, a sort of quite a sort of serious installation, I think go to a, a, a good firm with a track record that's been around for a long while, is recommended by others. Architects and designers will recommend them. Um, you know, go to a, a, a decent integrator AV company um, uh, with a track record. That is really important. Um, otherwise, you know, those that want to visit Peter Jones, listen, there are, you know, the, the, they offer good advice. And frankly, if you're going to go down the Sonos route, uh, it's, you know, it, it is it is very good. You can't you can't ignore it. And if they want um, to get in touch, and Angus, if they want to get in touch with you directly to seek your advice? I'm simply now just angus at angusgibson.com. Well, there you go. That's nice and straightforward. Um, well, look, I mean, I've, I've really enjoyed this. I think, I honestly think people will like listening to that because it, it, it's a little bit of history. Everyone remembers it. Everyone's probably seen all sorts of old hi-fi stuff lying around in their parents' houses. 
and the new generation are probably wondering, well, how do I get the best out of my house? So I think there's been some interesting, um, interesting advice there. So listen, Angus, thank you so much for coming along. And if anybody wants any more, you heard that Angus and angusgibson.com, I'm sure he can give you some advice. So thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk, Angus, much appreciated. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me, Ed.